these are the stories we share around the dinner table, tell in front of the campfire, and listen to on our porch. This is a place where tales are told and stories are heard. Grab your tea, your cocoa, your wild turkey whiskey, your wine. Welcome to season two of the Storyteller's Porch, where we will be hearing tales of the farm with your host and storyteller, Jill Davis. Welcome back to the Storyteller's Porch for episode two of season two. I am Jill Davis, your host, and I'm glad you decided to come back. If you haven't already listened to episode one, you might want to pause here and go back and listen to it because it's kind of the foretelling of what we're going to talk about today. And joining me today on my podcast, as she will be through the whole season, is Emily Chase Smith, my friend, my guide, my person who keeps me on track and helps me make sure I get the story told in a way that everybody will hear it. Welcome, Emily. I noticed that you did not say helps me manage and make decisions about my farm in Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> that is true because we would have a very different experience if I had done that. Um, it's so tough limitations, Jill. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't ask a Southern California girl about your Kansas farm. <laughs> it's, it's so funny because, you know, I think we all have that little house on the prairie concept of what a house of farming Kansas looks like. I don't even think they ever ended up in Kansas. I think it was South Dakota, but they're all kind of the same, right? It's it's just one of those things that it's um, such an interesting way that the farm and the farmhouse came to us. So in this episode, we do have a drink on the porch. Emily has her ice water, but if you were together, I would have poured you a shot to share with me a wild turkey whiskey. Because that would have fallen over. <laughs> <laughs> that was my mother's favorite was wild turkey whiskey. And I'm sure that was not her favorite as she got older. She became a teetotaler in her middle years. She drank at the beginning, a little bit in the middle, and then she no longer drank. We always do a shot of wild turkey to my mother. And I thought that was fitting for today. Very so, nice. so if you're a listener, go grab and you have whiskey, grab a shot. We'll have some. <laughs> This just turned into a different podcast. <laughs> it just did. Maybe I think maybe I could get in trouble on the radio for or I'm podcasting for suggesting people drink. So do it with caution. How do they say it in the ads? Drink wisely and, and responsibly. Responsibly, yes. Blah, blah, blah. Don't sue me. <laughs> just yeah. drink whiskey. <laughs> exactly. <Zip around laughs> and, and I'm sure my mother drove on those farm roads a few times with a few too many shots of whiskey in her, but that was a long time ago. Yeah. This episode, Emily, is going to be the genealogy of the farm. And for me, that's really important because how I got the farm, like I, people ask me, did you go buy a farm? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> actually, they would use my hard-earned money or hard-inherited money to go buy a farm. Maybe now I would, now that I know about the farm, but I certainly wouldn't have back before then. And so the genealogy of it is important because it created through the genealogy of the farm is the genealogy of the people who farm that land. And that is who I became and went on down into my children's lives and will continue through my grandchildren. And so that genealogy is important. So I'm going to briefly go through the genealogy. You're going to keep me on track and ask questions when I mess up. And then I'm going to read the story of my great-grandfather as it was um, written for the Cheyenne County History book many, many years ago. You mentioned in the first episode, Homestead. So can you kind of define that for me? I absolutely can, Emily. And, you know, I've said this for so long because it was part of our family lore. You know, every family has its own stories, right? My family did not have a lot of those stories. My dad was born in 1927. He worked very hard. They had a very interesting life. My mother was very busy. She had um, six of us children, plus she was a foster parent. So we didn't do a lot of family lore. Like my kids and I, we sit around, we laugh about the stories we talk about. They were very busy. So we didn't have a lot of them. But the lore was always great grandpa Henry homesteaded in 1888. That is like a line, although the actual line from my dad would have been great granddad homesteaded in 1888. So what homesteading means is back in the day when the United States was trying to expand their territories, one way that they did that is they offered acreage to people 
if they would go move out on this land and improve it. And so as I was looking through that, the Homestead Act was changed many, many different times. I think there's probably like 15 different amendments to the Homestead Act. But the main concept of it, which is all we really need to do here on the podcast, if you want to know more about it, you can do what I do, did and Google it. <laughs> but the basics of it is that in the late 1800s, you could get either 160 acres, which was a quarter section, that was not great land, or if you got something um, that was like close to a railroad line or was part of a city or a town that was already developed, you could get 80 acres. And based on what I've been able to research about my great grandfather, he did the 160 acres. You had to pay $10 down and $4 a year later. And within five years, you had to have put some sort of a building or living quarters on that property. And if you did that and continue to improve the land and continue to live on the land, after seven years, that land was belonged to you. Hmm. Okay. And that is what my great grandfather did. And there's actually a line in here that I will be reading in a little bit, but I'm going to actually say it right now. In 1932, George, who was my great grandfather, said, the land was never mortgaged, but sometimes it was pretty hard to pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. And he said that in 1932, and I am sure there were times it was hard to pay the taxes in 1932, because that's what you did back then. You homesteaded, but you did have to pay property taxes. So that's what he, he worked on. So it was my great grandfather, George Henry, who moved to the farm originally. Shortly after he moved there, he married Josephine Peterson, who was originally from a town called Loch Navy in Sweden. And we will talk some more about those myths as I read the story. <laughs> then they had my grandmother, along with a few other children, what we'll talk about in a minute, my grandmother, whose name was Florence Myrtle Davis. I and love I Myrtle. If I, I was having another kid, I think I might name her Myrtle. I love that name. And for me, it invokes memories of growing, or not growing up, but being a young adult in the South where all the crepe myrtle is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, crepe myrtle does not grow in Colorado because it just can't handle the freeze we get here. But my grandmother hated that name. So even as I say that, I want to say, Grandma, forgive me for saying your whole name out loud, but it's important. <laughs> when, um, when I was younger, we went to a doctor's office one time and they said, you know, we need your full name. And she refused to give them her full name. She said, I will not use that name. But her full name was Florence Myrtle Davis. And she was Florence Myrtle Henry. And then she married a man named Ray Davis and became Florence Myrtle Davis. And that was in 1925. In 1927, my father, James George Davis, was born. And in uh, 1951, my father married Elizabeth Sue Leathers, who became Elizabeth Sue Davis. And in 1962, I was born as Tabitha Jill Davis. As of 1956, my parents no longer lived on the farm. There's more about that in the first episode. Okay, Emily, I did that pretty quick. Questions well, about- Well, I'm taking notes, which I think most of our podcast listeners don't have the benefit of. But look, I created a really cute family tree for you. Well, great. We will put that up on the website. Oh, I well, I got to be that. careful. Maybe I shouldn't make any like personal notes. So yeah, not Buy milk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or where you need to go tomorrow night. Um, so <laughs> what, I, what I did is I tried really hard to tell and write and make notes about the story about my great grandfather, but everything I know is hearsay. My great grandfather died in the thirties, like 60 years before I was born. My grandfather died in the 40s, which was 20 years before I was born. My grandmother did live until the mid 80s, but I was this little girl. I wasn't interested in her stories. And because, you know, the life expectancy was shorter back then, she was old. Like I remember her when she was like 60, 62 to come, she came and visited us. And she was very, very old and sick. It was just a different world. So I didn't get to ask her a lot of questions. So a lot of the stories that I know in my mind are the stories rewritten in the mind of a 12-year-old, which are probably not super accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so I was given a book by my father many years ago, and it is called Cheyenne County History. That is the whole name of the book. There's like a lot of Cheyenne counties. No, there's no state. There's no town. <laughs> nothing. It was just, and it's this huge book. Let me see. It's like the pages are what, what, these are not like eight and a half by 12. They're the next size up. Oh, there are 746 pages in here. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you aren't the only one interested in the genealogy and preserving it. That's like a pretty big deal. It is a pretty big deal. And it's pretty cool that there is so much in here. So there is a story in here about my great-grandfather, George Henry, and his wife, Josephine. And so we are going to pretend that it is story time, and I am going to read the story. So here we go. George Albert Henry was born on December 8, 1861, at Stockport, Morgan County, Ohio. He was the son of Robert D. and Mary A. Henry. In 1886, he left Ohio and journeyed to his sister, Florence Kellison's home at Brock, Nebraska. Soon after, the Kellisons moved to Cheyenne County, Kansas, and George came with them. At Oberlin, Kansas, he went to the land office and sight unseen filed homestead papers on a piece of land that wouldn't be known as Stockport Farm even to this day. I'm gonna interrupt and give you a few of my side notes on this. It is still Stockport Farm. We still have the barn that my great-grandfather painted with the word Stockport Farm mm -hmm. in a remembrance to the town that he was born in, Stockport, Ohio. Those were good sod years. Now, honestly, Em, I have no idea what a sod year is. That <laughs> Whether or not it was good or bad, it was a mediocre sod year, Jill. We're not real sure. <laughs> I know. I'm like, all I can think of when I think of sod is rolled up, you know, layers of grass. So it must have something to do with that. But those were good sod years. George farmed with a team, which was a team of mules, which again, we have a picture of those teams of mules from 1920s on our Facebook page and all those places. He erected a one room sod house with a west entrance which sat about 100 feet from the north-south road and about 40 rods north of the south section line. Now, that sounds like gibberish to me. <laughs> it makes sense. I don't know what a rod is. I should have looked that up. I know it's a, a form of measurement. And it is still there. There are still outbuildings there. In order to make a living, he spent four summers working at the Atwood Brickyard, helping make the bricks that were used in the foundations and chimneys of the first courthouse in Rollins County. He walked to the brickyard on Monday mornings, leaving home at 2 a.m. and arrived back to his homestead on Saturdays about noon. Now, I'm going to point out while he was doing this, he was also farming the land and raising a family. And so was, so was Josephine out mm -hmm. there by herself. That's such a great reminder. This whole story is pretty much just about George. Yeah. He didn't do a lot of talking about the women back then. But How there many is kids did they have. I know about Florence Myrtle. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Thank you for that question. We're going to get to that here in just a second because now comes the more the next interesting part. Okay. He carried the mail west out of Atwood twice a week, going to Blakeman, Celia, and Wano. For a period of time, he worked for the railroad gang, which was building the first track out west of Wheeler, Kansas. He continued to carry the mail west from Atwood in 1888. He was sworn in at the new post office in St. Francis. He additionally carried the first mail between Bird City and St. Francis. Now, this is what's so interesting. I was told he was part of the Pony Express. Nah, he wasn't. He just rode a horse to deliver the mail between the two. <laughs> was Pony Express a company? You know, the Pony Express was earlier than when my grandfather was around. Oh, okay. At this point, they had more mail stations. They delivered mail more to people. It was a little bit different. Hmm. I'm not going to go into, there's like three paragraphs here of the angles and the roads he took on these mail route routes. We're going to skip right over that. I'm going to have a hard time making a table of that. Yeah, I, I don't know what it means, but it's a lot, a lot of angles. And this is my favorite. He also, one of the routes angled northwest out to the old John Reinhardt place. Oh, sure. The Reinhardt place. Well, well, that place. So then going forward. Mr. Henry dug many wells in this county. Workers on one of the early Bird City water wells hit solid rock at 200 feet. They hired George to chisel through 16 inches of rock. It took him nearly two weeks to break through, but the use of dynamite was out of the question. 
Now, this is important because back then they did have machines that would dig through wells, but when they got too hard, they couldn't. So my grandfather would go down 200 feet. That's what it says here. And then chiseled, hand chiseled 200 feet into a well and hand chiseled 16 inches down of solid rock. And we're not talking like an inch around, you know, that's a pretty big size to get a well going. And he didn't use any dynamite. So what most people, when they find out that um, my great grandfather was George Henry, they'll say, oh yeah, we have a hand chiseled well. We know your great grandfather did it. It's he probably too stayed down there for probably days at a time, right? Well, I'm guessing it took what, let's see, it took him nearly two weeks. He had to get out and go to the bathroom somehow, right? I'm yeah, thinking he was on the ground. ground. He probably just took a bunch of food. I mean, who wants to keep going out there and pulling him back up? You know, uh, he was, he was labor, right? Right. All he's doing is, is laborious. And generally we're not like, are you comfortable down there? No, that was not the thing, was it? You know, it's okay. I'm feeling like the little, like Ramona the Pest when she was listening to the story of Mike Mulligan, the steam shovel. She's like, but he had to go to the bathroom. That was my thought. Oh, oh my they probably sent him with a bucket. <laughs> yes. So then the next paragraph is about his marriage to Josephine Peterson. What's funny about this is there's no actual month of when he got married in this story because... They got married in October of 1894. And my dad wrote that into the book. It was October of 1894. So in 1894, during a terrible drought, he was married to Josephine Peterson, who was keeping a house on her brother John's homestead. Josephine was born on 23 April, 1869 at Navy, Sweden. Following her brother's establishment in Cheyenne County, he sent for her. She came alone on the three-week voyage from Stockholm. On arrival at the Bird City Depot, she was greeted by a Swedish man. We don't know who that Swedish man is. It's never mentioned. Mm. He took her to her brother's farm. Josephine was frightened to be riding across the prairie with a man she did not know, but was glad he could converse with her in her own language. Her brother, who was standing at the door of his prairie home, was a very welcome sight. Henry Weaver, a justice of the peace, lived a little over one half mile north of the Peterson homestead. One evening, George and Josephine walked to Weaver's house, got married, and then walked back to the Peterson farm afterwards. Now, this is interesting because there's really no dates here, right? Mm -hmm. They got married in October of 1894. Just file that little detail away. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go, why it's important. Four children were born to the Henrys on the Stockport farm. Robert Lincoln, born January 17th, 1895, just four months after they got married. That is why. Scandal. We, scandal. We never talked about um, <laughs> when they got married, and that's why it's never listed here. And it wasn't until my great uncle Bob died, he's the one who was born four months after they got married, that mm -hmm. my dad started telling us that there was only four months from the time they got married until the time he was born. We don't know what happened. One of the family rumors was that my grandmother came from um, Sweden pregnant. Mm -hmm. Another one was that that gentleman, she rode um, home on from the train depot to her brother's house, may have been the dad, but the consensus is it was probably George Henry. And when they found out she was pregnant, which would have been a lot farther along than we know now because of right. Yeah. You know, you know. And they got married one night during a ter terrible drought. They walked to the Justice of the Peace and got married. Let me ask you again, when did she come over? How long was she there before she married George? It doesn't tell us anywhere. Oh, okay. It does not tell us anywhere. I've gone through every story I could find on George Henry, and I cannot find a time when Josephine Peterson came over. Interesting. So, yes, it is. So there's our little family scandal for a moment. Mm -hmm. They had four children who were all born on Stockport Farm. Robert Lincoln, who was born on January 17th, 1895. He married on June 2nd, 1917 to Minnie Elizabeth Dunn. And that was my great aunt Minnie, who was the first person who ever gave me a piece of lemon meringue pie. Oh, thank you, Minnie. I remember that well. 
Their children are James Albert, who was born August 13, 1918, and Ida Lou, born March um, 15, 1924. I do know but that both of them have passed away. I do not know their death dates. Mary Helene was born on May 8, 1896, and married on April 15, 1915, to William Lester Hoyt. Both of them have both passed away as well. They had a set of twins, William Francis and Josephine Harriet, born on August 16, 1921. Again, both Francie and Josephine have passed away since this was written. Florence Myrtle was born March 1904. That was my great, my grandmother. She <laughs> married on the 4th of March, 1924 to Raymond Davis, who was a World War II veteran. Now let's do the math here. My grandfather, Ray, was born in 1888 and married my grandmother in 1924. How old would that have made him? 88, 98, 08, 20. So he was 30, 36 years old. Wow. He was 36 years old when he married my grandmother, who for the time was an old maid. And let's the just- How old was she? She was born 1904. She was 20. Mm -hmm. I can do that math. Okay. I, I could too. And it was like, it's, she got married on her birthday. She was born on March 4th, 1904 and got married on March 4th, 1924. Hmm. But she was considered, she was always embarrassed that she was an old maid. You know, that's why, why she always felt like Mr. Davis, as she called him, married her was because she was becoming an old maid and he was very interested in their farm. Okay, so wait a minute. We got to pause here. So she would say that late, later on. She called her husband Mr. Davis. She calls him Mr. Davis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mr. Davis is 36, mm -hmm. and he gets to marry a 20-year-old. I think Mr. Davis is batting up. <laughs> I think so too. And my grandmother was a beauty. She was yeah. beautiful. And I have you know, pictures of her. And it's so funny when I put my grandmother and myself and my daughter and my niece all in a row, family resemblance is so strong. It's amazing. Yeah. It's so strong. <laughs> she had a twin who was born also on 4th March, 1904. And this is a story that the family lore said that he died of a burst appendix in the house at Stockport Farm. But and what was his name? He was, a, he was the twin? He was the twin. This was my grandmother's twin named Francis Martin. Okay. And he was born March 4th, 1904, and died in 1921. But he did not die of a burst appendix at the house. I know oh. our audience can't see your surprised face. Because, because I already knew this story from a long time ago. And that's what I was always told. But as I read through this research, he was taken to Bird City, where Dr. George R. Pegg confirmed he was suffering from a ruptured appendix. Now, Emily, I had a ruptured appendix when I was in my late 20s. They just operated, took it out, gave me some antibiotics, and I was fine. Mm -hmm. I was down for a few days, but I had two little kids, so I was okay being down for a few days. <laughs> is there another one you can remove? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But th this is what happened to my grandmother's twin. A bed was obtained for him at the county home, but the doctor did not do surgery on him because it was already too late to help him. Dr. Pegg and Jeannie Tippy, matron of the county home, cared for him until his death one week later on 7 June 1921. Burial was in the Bird City Cemetery. I do have pictures of all of the headstones that are related to me on our website. Mm. And my grandmother, so again, this is not in the writing here, but my grandmother proactively had all of her children's appendixes removed. How do you say plurals of appendix? <laughs> Um, I don't know, uh, removed by a traveling doctor in the house in Stockport Farm because she was so afraid of letting them die to a ruptured appendix because that's what happened to her twin. So, and as I'm recalling this story, perhaps my mind has made it more sensational. Was it on the kitchen table? That's what I've always been told. He was it without anesthesia? No, they gave them ether or ether, ether. They gave ether. them ether on the kitchen table in the farmhouse that they lived in, all three of them got their appendixes removed at the same time by the same traveling doctor because my grandmother was so afraid of losing her children to a ruptured appendix. So I told that story to my children uh -huh. and there was a large debate on whether you would want to go first or last 
<laughs> while being operated on on your kitchen table. Oh my goodness. I would love, you know what? I bet back in what year that would, that would have been like in the early thirties when that happened, there was no discussion. You were told, get on the table, end of subject, you know? Yeah. But we were talking about like, okay, so we were, we were liking it too. When you have to give a speech in school and it was like, you want to be the first one so you can get it over with, but now you're in pain. But if you're the last one, you have to watch everybody else do it. Yeah. It was was a whole driving home from school discussion. Well, if you guys have a, if the listeners have a discussion about this, I want to hear about it because I think that's the best part of storytelling, isn't it? Of what happens with the discussion. And as I recall my dad's story on this, he had to go first because he was the oldest. That's what I remember. Could be wrong. That's what they did. Did he have a big scar? He did have a big scar. Uh huh. Did it look like? home appendix removal scar you know, he ne- I only saw it one time because my dad never took his shirt off my dad was very proper he didn't do a lot of swimming and mm-hmm. one time he went swimming with us and there was I we, was little and I asked him why he had that line on his tummy and mm. that's the, of the story wow. so again interpretation of the mind of about a 10 year old mm-hmm. so as you're hearing this story listeners please go ask the questions now Whatever comes to your mind, go ask it now. Or if you still have older living relatives, go ask them. I will go ahead and finish um, reading through this because I think it's fun. Um, So there were red and spotted shorthorn cattle raised on Stockport Farm. The herd varied from 25 to 50 head, and there were usually 8 to 10 milk cows. Robert Henry recalls that there was a lot of pasture then. My dad and I drove cattle five or six miles to the South Beaver, to drink on many occasions when the wind didn't blow enough to turn the windmill. By the time we got back home, the cattle were just as thirsty as when we started out. (laughs) When Robert was about 16 years old, he assisted with the building of a three-room sod house with a west entrance just a little way north and west of the original one. Water had to be carried from the well that was located out west of the first soddy. A big barn was built a little later. In 1915, the Henry family hauled lumber from Bird City for the construction of a new two-story, eight-room farmhouse. The new house sat east of the first Saudi, which a Saudi is a sod house. And somewhere floating around the family, there are pictures of my grandmother and her twin standing outside that sod house, but I don't have any in my collection. It had no basement. The family ditch irrigated their garden out by the windmill, cabbage, turnips, Lettuce, pumpkins, et cetera, were kept in a cellar, and that cellar still exists, and I do have a picture of it. Josephine, my great-grandmother, succumbed to cancer on November 2nd, 1936, at the Stockport Farm. George spent 13 months in the hospital at Goodland before cancer of the prostate claimed his life on June 14, 1943. Both are interred at Bird City Cemetery. Florence Myrtle Henry Davis, who made Goodland her home in later years, died there on January 22nd, 1985, and is buried in the Goodland Cemetery. Robert Henry, at the time of this writing in the 1980s, um, is a resident of rural Bird City. His sister, Mary Henry Hoyt, lives in the city of Bird City with her son, Francie. And as we know, George said, the land was never mortgaged, but sometimes it was pretty hard to pay the taxes. And you know, Emily, that's where we're going to close up today's story time because I think that is our collective impact for today. You know, the storyteller's porch is not designed to be meaning making, but as human beings, we make meaning out of everything. And I read the story of my great grandfather building a sod house and building the cellar, and I know about the outbuildings he built. And then he says it was pretty hard sometimes to pay the taxes. Right now in our world, sometimes it's pretty hard to pay the taxes. And somehow, with hope, we will all get through this time. And it just continues in the family lineage. I know that I can guarantee you, as my dad would say. Whoa! <laughs> Throwing out the D word. <laughs> well, this is his old cuss word until he got older and forgot he wasn't supposed to cuss in front of girls. Um, but I will guarantee you that when my grandfather built that slot house in 1935 or 19, I, I don't remember what year it was, in the early 1900s, and then built that other wooden house for his family, he did not think someday my great granddaughter, Jill Davis, will be figuring out what to do with what I built 
And yet, here I am, and that land will bring hope. We are hoping to turn it into a retreat center and a place for people to get away to, to relax, whether it's my own family or other families and your kids, and where people can go and see how we live off the land, how crops are grown, how cattle are raised. All the things we're missing out on because life has changed so much over the many the hundred plus years since my great grandfather homesteaded. So that is the collective impact I have from today's personal story. Em, do you have anything to add before we close out our stories? I was just thinking, uh, do you still have the same kitchen table in the house? Oh no, because <laughs> my my kids might not come. <laughs> We do not. We do not. But here is another farm story that goes along with that before we completely close out. Is I found this fabulous 1950s um, metal table and chairs on the Cheyenne County Facebook Marketplace. And I wanted it so bad for my farmhouse because we're, we're having to completely refurnish it. So I contacted the owner and I said, you know, but I can't get back out to Kansas till three months down the road. I can pay you now. Is there any way you could hold on to it? And she said, you know what? We'll just put it out in the feed barn. <laughs> hold it for you till you get here. And I said, I can pay you now. She said, oh, no, no. Just let me know when we're coming. You're coming out and we'll make arrangements to deliver it. I looked up where they live. They live 20 miles from where my farm is. Aww. I texted them this week because I'm going out next week to get it. And she said, oh, yeah, we've got it here for you. We'll deliver it on this day at this time. Providing the rain doesn't come and mess up the roads. <laughs> <laughs> always community, always hope. That is the personal story with the collective impact. And once again, if you have a story about farming or ranching or growing up out in rural America, I want to hear it. I want to help you share it because those stories are what bring us hope in difficult times. Here at the Storyteller's Porch, we believe we are the stories we share. Keep living your story and meet us next time here on the porch. And be sure to bring your favorite drink. And take a shot of that wild turkey whiskey, but drink responsibly. <laughs>